coming out tonight, if you guys could just stand and pray with us before we get started. Dear Lord, thank you for this night you've given us, O oh Lord, to be able to come into your house. Thank you, Lord, for letting us be here to be able to worship you and to be able to get to know you more. Whether we may be going through hard times or we just need you right by our side. We pray that you'll be there and lay your healing hands on us and make a miracle happen. In Jesus' name, amen. Believe. 
deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear.
take me as you find me all my fears and failures fill my life again give my life to follow everything I believe in now I serve mountains you rose and conquered that grave thank you Lord for being here thank you for being right by your side and let us come into your house and worship you tonight Lord in Jesus name amen amen it's it's not just a statement, it's a fact. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Okay, maybe you just think it's a statement. Let's remind ourselves, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, when we get to come together, we should rejoice. Praise the Lord as 
everyone goes to their appointed places. I welcome those that are watching online through our live stream here on Facebook. Welcome to Spirit of Life, and I pray that you receive everything God has for you this evening. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Uh, if you in house, if if you have a a need, can you just raise your hand? You don't have to speak out. Just raise your hand. Everybody, I see some hands going up. All your kids doing good? Oh, we need prayer for for our kids. I was at a meeting today with other pastors across our city, and and there's so much we listen to. One individual, the chief of police of here in Fond du Lac, talk about all the different things our kids are facing. And what a cultural shock society is becoming, especially as we see all the anarchies that the pandemic has brought. A lot of identities have been lost. So if you're watching online, you can... Put an emoji, your hands raised up. If you have a prayer, you can let us know what your prayer is online. But let us pray together. Heavenly Father, this evening, God, Lord, we just come before you. We know that you are our healer. So, God, we claim victory in all of our physical needs. There's so many that are suffering, Lord, from sickness in their body, disease in their body. Lord, that they need a physical healing touch. And, Lord, we... We claim it through what your word says. By your stripes, we are healed. Lord, I thank you for allowing us to come into your presence, Lord, and petition you for the needs within our lives, for our children, Lord, and our children's children, for us of age, God, that you touch our grandchildren and you touch our children, Lord, and you, you protect the children of those that are here, those that are watching, God, that that you would just surround them. Lord, I, I pray for those that are working in the, in the front of, of so many desperate situations. Lord, I lift before you, God, those that uh, are nurses and doctors and people working in the hospitals. I lift before you the, the firemen and the first responders, the police departments. Lord, I lift before you tonight our military and those that, that truly protect us and give us freedom. And, and Lord, tonight is... As we continue through 21 days of prayer and fasting, Lord, we lift before you our, our government officials. God, we, we pray that you have your way, that you put your hand upon situations, Lord, but we, but we lift them before you, God, knowing that, God, that you're in control. And Lord, we just ask that you would touch. God, I pray for those that are feeling down and out tonight, Lord, that they feel a little less worthy. God, I pray for those that are contemplating doing away with their own lives tonight, God. I pray that the joy of who you are, joy unspeakable, will just fill them up to a place of overflowing. God, I pray, I pray for the one that thinks they have no need of you. Those that feel that they're all right in their circumstance and their situation. Lord, I pray that you'll draw them in. That you'll send someone alongside of, of them to, to encourage them to give their life over to you. And Lord, we just thank you. Now, Lord, for this evening, for this teaching, Lord, open up our minds and our hearts to receive of you. And Lord, let it be applicable. Let, it, let us be able to apply your word to our lives that we may grow. That we can be more like you and we can maneuver through this world that we live in. For your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome tonight. We're continuing on our teaching on Joseph, a man of integrity and of forgiveness. Last week we were bringing forth a teaching and tonight I want to continue upon what God 
is doing in this in the middle of chaos. Any, anybody in here or watching online, especially in here, uh, it, I'm glad this isn't a boat we just turn over. Everybody's on on the starboard side of the ship here tonight. Well, that gives me opportunity to just look at you more. Forgive me for not looking up, but for those that are here. How many has ever went and started trying to reason with God or reason through your situation? Maybe, maybe you've tried to scheme a little bit to get what you want. Anybody ever been guilty of that? You don't have to raise your hand. Just look at me. I can tell that some of us have been that way, and I use myself in that example. If we look at Joseph, we know he is the son of a man named Jacob. And Jacob was named Jacob because he had latched on to the hill, H-E-E-L, not H-I-L-L, but the hill of his brother. Jacob also means deceiver. And he grew in to be fulfilling of that name. It's very important names that we attach. Hey, anybody ever been guilty of, of just describing someone by their own name? Oh, that's just how they are, and you use their name. You know, if I just said a single word, I know it's not a biblical word or a name, share. Everybody would know at least one song that would resonate with you. Those one name individuals. Jacob, in the word of God, especially now he is being started being talked to and used. He's also, his name is Israel. Does anybody know what the word Israel, the name Israel means? And all the hands went up. If you have that answer online, go ahead and type that in. Israel means one that fought with God, one that struggled with God. And God gave him that name because Jacob was the one that struggled with God. He fought against him, and he ended up with a lame hip. So I'm giving you all that information to give you a better understanding why it's so important when we read the Word of God that we understand the individuals that we're talking about. So here is Jacob. Let, turn your Bibles into the 43rd chapter of Genesis. Starting with verse 1. Now the famine was severe in the land, and it came to pass, when they had eaten up the grain which they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, Go back, buy us a little food. But Judah spoke to him, saying, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. And if you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. Verse 5, But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. And Israel said, well, again, this is Jacob. And Israel said, why did you deal so wrongfully with me as to tell the man whether you had still another brother? Verse 7. But they said, the man asked us pointedly about ourselves and our family, saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we told him according to these words. Could we possibly have known that he would say, bring your brother down? See, in a period of our life, things happen and we don't always understand. We experience things at a young age, at an older age. There's things happening all the time around us that we don't quite understand. And for you and I, we need to learn how to be men and women of integrity and let our yes be yes and our no be no. And the brother said, look, 
He asked us, what was we supposed to do? Now, again, remember who Jacob is. Jacob is a father of the sons that represent the 12 tribes of Israel. But he went back into becoming someone that was once known as a deceiver. And so Jacob's mind started to put a plan together. And we see that the first thing that happens, and I haven't read that to you yet, is that he wants to deny the fact that his son was going to go. And so he tried to manipulate and delay what needed to take place. And in the world that we're living today, and this is, this is something you can apply to your own life, you know what the end results has to be. But how far away do we go to avoid it? That's a left-handed circle. There's things in our life we know we need to give up. But how far in the circle do we go away from what needs to happen? If you're sitting here tonight or watching online or watching in replay and you're dealing with a certain situation, and let me just call it what it is, if you're dealing with a certain sin in your life that just kind of keeps creeping up on you and tempting you and then all of a sudden you fall prey to it and you and you find yourself making excuses for what happened. Instead of dealing with the situation, you've avoided it. And a lot of times when we come around to full circle, we have to deal with it again. In my pastoral experience, I've counseled individuals and we deal with certain issues that they're dealing with, and I give them all the understanding and give them all the biblical uh, foundation to stand on, but until we are willing to deal with it, it always comes back. Now, my wife's not teaching or preaching uh, tonight, but, but there was a situation I want to share with you. There was a situation we were living in a place that, well, it... It was a hard time in our life, and, and I went to this house, and when I came out of the house, I looked at her, and I said, I will never live in a place like that. In less than two weeks, that's where we were living, the exact house. And I was killing snakes in the bedroom. And if it rained, because our bedroom was downstairs in the basement, there would be a small... And this is a southern term, but you'll understand. There was a small creek that just kind of ran through the basement. So there was a lot of water that flowed through, and there was always mice. And guess what chases mice? Snakes. And I killed several. And there was several snakes that I killed, and Annette was walking down the stairs, and I would flush down the toilet before she would get there. She didn't realize that we were dealing with a problem. One day she, she come running up the steps and she says, you got to come kill this. And, and it was a spider. And the body of this, it, it, it wasn't a tarantula, but it was as big as a tarantula. I, I, you know, it was some demon from hell, I think, is what it was with eight legs. And I know that I was going to step on it and then I realized I don't want to step on that. It could carry me away. So I hit it with a driver. I had my golf clubs, and I hit it with a driver, and instead of it just splatting, it squeaked. <laughs> Literally. So I'm at work, and I was working for a, a place, and, and this is a time in our life for, to give a little more background. You know, I was making six figures uh, a year, and then all of a sudden I went to making $5.10 an hour. You know, life was rough. And she called me and she says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but there's a snake. And I said, 
did you kill it? No, I didn't kill it. I said, you need to kill it. She went back downstairs. Snake was gone. Didn't know where that snake was. I can walk on water when it comes to snakes. I hate them. But she learned a great lesson that day. Even though she didn't sleep downstairs in the basement for several weeks. I did. Scared to death, but I did. I didn't know if the snake was going to fall out. But guess what? She learned a lesson. What do you think that lesson was? Say it louder. <coughs> if you're dealing with something, you need to kill it. Not just don't turn your back. You've got to kill whatever's coming. And now I'll apply that thought to your mind. You have to kill the things within your life that you know is going to become a detriment if you don't deal with it. Or we can walk around, as my wife's case, she ran back up to the top of the stairs, called me again, it's not there, it's not there. So, this is what Jacob, a.k.a. Israel, is doing. He is starting to figure out how he can Make it to where his son, Benjamin, doesn't have to go. So he has this thing starting to process in his mind. And then all of a sudden the boys came to him and said, Look, we have no more food. We're going to have to go back to Egypt to get what we need. And Jacob starts to put together, well, let's take some gifts. Let us provide some things that, that, that maybe they'll accept. And they finally said, no, look, we have to take Benjamin. We're not going if we don't take Benjamin. See, God has a plan for each and every one of us. And he wants it his way. Now, this is where I come up. Have you reasoned? <laughs> have you tried to scheme a little bit. Have you come to a place that you've ever knelt down and prayed and you, and you had this negotiation with God? That negotiation, well, God, if you'll do this, I'll do that. I don't know how many people has prayed to God, asking God to relieve them from either some kind of financial burden. I remember my sister she had a tumor on her brain, and she still has a shunt for, for that processing of the fluids leaving her brain. But I remember the day she says, God, if you will just heal me from this, I will never miss church again. Well, she never missed church again because she wasn't aiming for it. <laughs> Think about it for a moment. She never showed up. She never attended church other than for a funeral or a wedding. And then she was back at the altar again because, and I, I'm not a, a pastor of doom and gloom, but there's something about when you reason with God and you don't fulfill your side. Anybody ever done that? Broke your contract, your, your, your statement to God? If you'll do this, I'll do that. Well, her daughter has dealt with tumors and cancer throughout her entire body. Now, that, I don't know if that's of God. I can't stand there and say this is what God did. But I do know this. It's not good to make a deal with God and a deal with the devil at the same time and turn your back on God. That's what happened. So let's go on with this. Judah came to him. Now, again... The name Judah, this is a teaching tonight. I'm trying to stay focused on the teaching. Judah is the tribe, the lion of Judah is the legacy of where Christ comes from. Okay? So Judah goes to Jacob 
And he speaks to his father, and he, he's, he just simply says in verse 6, why did you deal, this is Jacob speaking, why did you deal so wrongfully with me as to tell the man whether you had still another brother? Why did you bring this trouble on me? Jacob went from denial of saying, I, I don't want to do this. And it happens in our lives. Have you ever started to blame somebody else for the result of what you're doing? That's what's happening here. Jacob looks at Judah and starts to put the blame upon him. It's your fault. Why did you tell him that there was another brother? Why did you express to him that there was another brother? So what was being implied, and the enemy will come alongside of you, and he'll have an effect upon you. He will try to convince you to lie a little. Because that's what is being emphasized here. Why, why did you tell him the truth? Why didn't you tell him, no, there is nobody else? Now, I know there's some wheels turning in here, even though we're not jumping and hollering inside the sanctuary. And I don't know what's going on on the backside of the camera. But this is the facts. The enemy will come along and try to get you to start accepting what you know it's not, it, it's not for a man or a woman to stand behind a sacred desk, uh, stand in front of a, a sanctuary and proclaim what is being done wrong. Who is the first person that knows that you've done wrong? Be honest with yourself. I see fingers pointing back to the chest. You know when you've done wrong. You know when you've accomplished something that shouldn't have been accomplished. Because you feel not condemnation. If you continue to do it, condemnation comes of your own. Because sorrow and the burden of shame and guilt becomes too heavy. But you're the first individual that knows if you've done something wrong. So why do we do it? Well, because we're looking for that circle. <laughs> We, we're not dealing with the situation. We want to make the big circle. And, and eventually, we, we're so far away from the situation, we don't think it's going to have an effect. But what happens? There's a song about it. The circle of life. We're going to come back to that situation. It's going to be a snake in your basement that you should have took a shovel and cut its head off. Because it's going to show up again. And it did. And I killed the snake. But the circumstances with which we deal are seen within this. So here Jacob is trying to figure out how to scheme. And basically he says, look, boys, we don't know what all this means, but we do know that we're confused and we need God's help. Let us trust God for protection and insight is not what he said. That's what he should have said. Because as fathers, talking to all the men in here, if you're raising kids and, 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 and you're the mom and you don't have a father involved, but as men, we have to be men of integrity to raise a family. Because you will see in your children who you are you will have the reflection of who you are come forth out of your children. What happens in our lives is that we have to move past not trusting God or the uncertainty or, or the tolerance of just simply accepting what comes our way to to be what is due us, we have to come to a place of understanding that God is in control. 
Reading verse 8, Genesis chapter 43, for those in the crow's nest operating live stream. In Genesis 43, verses 8 through 10, it says, Then Judah said to Israel his father, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die both we and you, and also our little ones. Judah says, I myself will be a surety for him. From my hand you shall require him if I do not bring him back to you and set him before you. Then let me bear the blame forever. For if we had not lingered Surely, by now, we would have already returned the second time. I want you to grasp this, please. Don't, kids don't bother me, so don't let them bother you. He makes a statement in verse 10. Hear, hear the words. Surely we have already would have went and got back by now. The second time. So how does that relate to us? We waste time procrastinating what we must deal with. We waste time and energy and and I, I, I can tell you the truth. Resources. Trying to manipulate the situation. And can I, do I have your permission just to be plain? It ain't a Burger King world. You can't have it your way all the time. You just can't order life for the day. Okay, today, I, you know, give me extra onions, but no pickles. You can't do that. Life comes at you. And it's a really about how we respond to what's happening. But the problem within our lives, and, and take notes, take mental notes of the next few things that comes out of my mouth. If we will become actionary, everybody wave at me. Thank you. There was really exuberant waving back here in the corner. If we would spend valuable time in doing what God calls us to do, we won't find ourselves falling into a place of insanity. And what is insanity? Doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. Now let's take that to the biblical side of things. There was a man that met Christ in the middle of the night, a Pharisee. And he says, how can I be? And Jesus looked at Nicodemus and says, you must be born again. Well, how can I enter back in to my mother's womb to be born again? He says, no, not of water, not of flesh, but of the Spirit. For you and I, we have to find ourselves, instead of going back to our old ways, again, let me relate this to you. Jacob started to go back into his old deceiving way. That's why it's so important for us to understand that, that Jacob and Israel is being used back and forth within this scripture. I'm trying to teach you tonight. Back and forth. See, you and I are not completed as yet, but we should have the desire to strive to become perfect before God. So there are some days we fall back into our old ways, but we know that it's a mental choice, a spiritual decision not to go there. But isn't it seem awful easy to slip back to our old ways of life? 
to slide backwards into what was comfortable instead of moving forward. And change is scary. But what's happening in this scripture, Judah comes to him and says, look, I'll take charge of Benjamin. I'll be responsible for what you're concerned for. That very issue is what Christ did for you and I when he says, I'll die for their sins. I'll become responsible for what needs to be taken care of. That's what happened that day that, that Christ come to a place and he said, not my will, but thy will be done. I'll take responsibility. Judas says, I'll take responsibility for Benjamin. And if I don't bring him back, it'll be on me. And in verse 9, the last word is forever. So in our lives, to become becoming what God wants us to do, there's a promise. And there's a blessing with the promise. And if we don't pursue the promise and the blessing that God has for us, we will always scheme to try to get around what we need to deal with. So it's easier to bring it to God, lay it at His feet, and leave it alone. Now Jacob, this teaching is not about Jacob, it's about Joseph, his son. Jacob shows one of a great a great application of being fearful in these one sentence. He says, If I am bereaved, I am bereaved. He's already concerned about it. He's not trusting God. He's not trusting his son Judah. He's not trusting the outcome. He's supposed to be a man of faith, a man of God, and he's already concerned. How many of you stayed up all night worrying about something? Promises of God are, are what they are. You read the Word of God. You claim the Word of God. You believe the Word of God, but yet you still spend the night <laughs> up worrying about it. Unless you work up at night time, and then you spend the day up worrying about it. Your mind never stops. But this is what it says in chapter 43, verses 13 and 14. Jacob says, Take your brother also and arise and go back to the man. And may God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release your other brother and Benjamin. And he says, If I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. Already doubting what God's going to do. See, Jacob says too much. He should have just ended his speech and just simply said, go. But he was already looking. And how many of you realize that when you put your sights on something, many times it's attainable. We got a horse girl in the house tonight. I've ridden horses most of my, my life. Same aspect. Anybody ride a motorcycle in here? Wherever you look is where you're going. And if you're on top of a horse running barrels, if you're not looking at that first barrel, that horse isn't going that way. Is that right? It's a fact, isn't it? Where you're looking on a motorcycle is where you're going to end up. It's a fact. In life, if you're not looking for a destination... You don't know where you're going. So when we find our focus to be upon God, we start to say, okay, I'm not looking at the uncertainties. I'm looking at the promises. I'm going to learn to trust God because I'm going to have faith in God. You cannot find yourself at a place that you're always trying to give an excuse. Everybody smile. your unfaithfulness. Ooh, that got heavy right quick, didn't it? Why are we already making an excuse before tomorrow ever comes for tomorrow? Why are we always putting in a, a plan that it's going to be somebody else's fault? Again, I counsel a lot. And I hear a lot of people, well, you don't know what I came from. Well, let me remind you as your pastor 
as someone that may you just may be flipping through. Well, we don't flip through channels on Facebook, do we? Uh, scroll. That's the word I'm looking for. As we're scrolling along, how many times have we already put doubt within ourselves? We void the promises of God because we put doubt in ourselves. We think it. We speak it. We void what God wants to do for us. And that's what Jacob did right there. He says, well, if you don't come back, I'll just be heartbroken. I'll be grieving myself to death. Because already he stated that, why do you do this and make me more gray-haired and put me in my grave? And then he puts together, let's give him a gift. This man, see, nobody knows that it's his son Joseph. Nobody knows that their brother. But let us put a gift together. Let us kind of sweeten the deal. Let us promise God something that we're going to do. Let us bring something else to the table. So they went. And when they got there, this is what happened. When they got there, they were received. And the next part of the teaching next week, literally Joseph told his head housekeeper, he says, go prepare a meal. All these guys are going to eat it at my house. That's what happened, but in their journey there, and that's where it comes down to you and I, the journey to our provision, the journey to where we know that what we need is available. There's some days you just have to make your course corrections. Instead of going out and around, go straight to the situation within your life. As individuals, as, as how we were created in, and born into sin, we, we tend to be more negative rather than positive. We tend to be more resistant instead of open to what is new and to what is unexpected. And when we face and we feel threatened of the unexpected, what might be tomorrow in God's hands, we, we start to put up our own defenses. For us to have a course correction... There's some techniques that I want to share with you. It's how to break some habits that we find ourselves in. Recognize and admit to yourself your negative mentality. And what is the greatest cure? It's found in Scripture. It says confess your sins. Confess your faults. There are some days we need to stand in front of a spiritual mirror and just recognize we can't do this without God. But I guarantee you that not everybody in the world is out to get you. Not every circumstance, even though it's rough, is, is, is put into place or detailed to cause you a detriment in your life. When you get past all the circumstances that you've literally fought to get through and you look back, you know that God had a plan to make you better, to make you stronger. Back when we were lifting weights, when I was lifting weights, no pain, no gain. You had to push yourself. 
There was no growth if you could just easily lift something. There's no growth within our spiritual life if we don't fight to accomplish and get through some of the through some of the test. I encourage you, instead of having all your thoughts horizontal, I brought that out a little bit in Sunday. You can't be looking at everything horizontally. Those things that are affecting you side by side by side by side. You have to start directing your focus vertically. You have to look above all your problems and look at the problem solver. You don't take your problems and tell God about your problems. You start reminding your problems who God is. You start confessing who God is. You start speaking the truth. You don't have to go negative. You don't have to lie. You don't have to slide around the corner making that big circle. You can go to it and speak to it. There's power in our tongue. You can either speak life or you can speak death. You can speak life over you and your family and your situations or you can speak death. In your jobs, in your homes, where you work, all the jobs and work is the same thing I know, but I'm, my brain's going a thousand miles an hour. You have the ability to speak life over it or just show up and grumble all day long. You can look for the opportunities that there is something better coming your way. See, if we just take and focus for five minutes of the promises of God in every situation of our life, we won't spend all day down in the mully grubs of life. We won't be down and depressed because of what's happening. But we can look to the promises. Yes, do we endure? Yeah, my heart breaks for people that have lost loved ones, lost their jobs, going through divorce, Finding out that their bank account is not what it once was. All these circumstances, I know. But this is what God says. What's impossible for you is possible through Him. And there's some days that it's God. I'm going to close on that. Everybody stand in, inside the sanctuary. There's some days. And I hope this is a revelation for you. There are some days you have to leave the promised land to go back where you had your exodus from to reclaim what God has for you. That makes sense? See, the promised land, Canaan, all the things. There are some days we have to go back and reclaim there's an old song we used to sing. I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what belongs to me. In your life, start speaking truth and life over who you are and allow the negativity and death not to be part of your language. Don't allow it to be part of your mentality because his word is true. And if something comes and it is an unexpected confrontation, step back and ask yourself this question. Is God, is God in control? And stand on His promise. Just simply ask, okay, is God in control? And the answer is a resounding yes. So we step back and we learn. We see. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know that you know, but I have no idea where this hits us tonight. And Lord, what I do know is this. The life that we live is full of changes and, and challenges. 
both of which God is difficult for us to face. And I'm also reminded that your word says that you will never leave us nor forsake us. God, that you will be with us as we face the test of our lives. As things come our way and we don't quite comprehend, but Lord, we know that And we trust you because you are in control. Lord, we know the end of this biblical story. We know how they're all reunited. God, you know the end of our stories. And Lord, I trust you. I apply to my life scripture. <laughs> Like Jeremiah 29 and 11, where you say that you have a plan for me. I trust in what is said in Philippians, that I have strength through you in all things. And all things work together for good. So God, let us learn to trust you. Let us look past the circumstances. Let us deal with situations immediately instead of taking longer. God, we're living in a time that as believers, there is a test. So Lord, I pray that we all have a testimony to bring glory to you. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. God bless you all. This coming Saturday, worship in the Word, in the house. Come and be a part. God bless you on Facebook.